Let me ask you, what if in the blink of an eye, millions of people all over the earth disappeared and were gone? What if a large coalition of nations gathered from the north of Europe and part of Africa and tried to invade Israel? Did you know that all of these events are predicted to happen in the future according to the Bible? Today, three biblical scholars who know Greek and Hebrew and have written 157 books between them are our guests. They are Dr. Mark Hitchcock, Dr. Ron Rhodes, and Jeff Kinley. It is interesting that in the polls of the Pew Research Center, they show that four in 10 Americans believe we are living in the last days. Further, they found out that 70% of evangelical Christians believe Christ could return during their lifetime. Where does the Bible talk about these things? Today, you will find out on this special edition of The John Ankerberg Show. Welcome to our program. I've got three wonderful guests that are fantastic biblical scholars. They've written 157 books between the three of these guys, and they're not just simple, tiny little books. They're big books that deal with Greek and Hebrew. They're all either masters or PhDs. The problem is some of you have never heard what we're going to say today, and we understand why a lot of you have never been told this. We're going to be talking about the rapture. We're going to be talking about the second coming of Jesus Christ to earth. We're going to be talking about the battle of Armageddon. We're going to be talking about the millennial kingdom. Do you know what those words mean? Do you recognize that more than 40 percent of Americans in our country, they believe we're living in the last days? Do you realize that there's a certain percentage of people that believe that Jesus Christ is going to return before they die? This is put out by the Pew Research Center, not us. And I'm saying, why do they feel that way? Well, I think you understand we've got a lot of problems in our country. So this starts to apply to that. And today, I want to go back to a verse that we missed last week that is a wonderful promise. It's good news. So I want you to listen. These are words that came from Jesus Christ himself. And Mark, I'm going to ask you to define them, but let me read them first of all. And uh, it's a passage that all of you probably read sometime in your church. I just wonder if you recognize what, what Jesus was saying here. It's in John chapter 14, and it's verses 1 through 3. And Jesus said this, Let not your heart be troubled. There are so many of you that are anxious and worried and troubled right now. Listen to what Jesus says. Why? He says, let not your heart be troubled. He says, you believe in God. A lot of you do. You believe also in me. Many of you do. Then Jesus says, look, if you believe that, in my Father's house are many mansions. This whole passage revolves around where the Father's house is at. I always ask my audiences when I'm talking to them, is he talking about Boston? Is that where the Father's house is at? No, it's heaven. The Father's house is in heaven. This whole passage revolves around that. He says, in my Father's house are many mansions, or different versions, dwelling places. If it were not so, I would have told you. I go, now listen to these words, I go, Jesus said, to prepare a place for you. If you are a believer in Christ, I go to prepare a place for you. And if I go and prepare a place for you, listen to this. This is Jesus saying, I will come again and receive you unto myself, that where I am, there you may be also. Fantastic words. Mark, drive this in. What does it mean? Well, the Father's house is heaven. Yep. It's the place where Jesus is going to come and take those someday who believe in him. And in this passage, we have a place, which is heaven, the Father's house. We also have here a promise. He says, I'm going to come and receive you to myself. But most importantly, we have a person. Uh, Jesus says, I'm going to come and I'm going to receive you uh, to myself. So Jesus is promising his followers that there's a time in the future when he's going to come and, and take us out of this world 
and he's going to take us to where he is, which is there in heaven in the Father's house. And that's the hope that we live with in this world today as God's people. And that's one of the reasons, the main reason why we can live a life where we're, we're not troubled and anxious and worried and consumed with all the, the things that are happening in our world today. It's a, it's a great message of hope. Yeah. And right. no, notice how uh, yeah. consistent scripture is on this, John. This text tells us that believers will be received unto Jesus. In 1 Thessalonians 4, uh, it says you will be caught up to be with Jesus. In 1 Thessalonians 1, 9 and 10, it says, I will snatch you up. Mm -hmm. And in each case, Christ takes action and they, they're up there with him mm -hmm. yeah. in the air. Yeah. And this comfort is so important. Let not your heart be troubled, Jesus said. In 1 Thessalonians 4, 18, therefore encourage one another with these words. People need encouragement today. Yeah, I mean, people, some of you say, do you really believe that Jesus is coming back? He said so in this passage. I will come again and receive you, if you're a believer, unto myself. John, that did you know in the Old Testament there's over a hundred prophecies that were literally fulfilled in the first coming? Over a hundred, literal. Yeah. Born of a virgin, born in Bethlehem, line of Abraham, line of David. I mean, we could go on and on. The prophecies that deal with the second coming will be just as literal. If you want to understand how God will fulfill a prophecy in the future, take a look at how He fulfilled a prophecy in the past. Yep. Yeah. Now, Mark, you have written, uh, Can We Still Believe in the Rapture? A tremendous book, which basically loaded with all of the scriptural passages that we're talking about and more, and defining terms, and uh, I'm just saying, you guys have written a good book. Here's another good book, and uh, Jeff has written this one, The End of America. We're going to have to talk a little bit about what this means. Is it going to happen, or is it not going to happen? What does the Bible say about these things? Does the Bible say anything about these things? You've got all that and statistics about what's happening in America. And Ron, uh, we all know that we've got problems in the Middle East, and uh, you've written a book about the northern storm rising. The nations, the Bible actually talks about Russia, Iran, and the emerging end times military coalition coming against Israel. It's like listening to the news on uh, any of the ABC, NBC, CBS, Fox stations uh, because you've got bickering between the very nations that Ezekiel 2,600 years ago talked about. Now, I want to come back to you because I don't want people to get confused about what we're talking about. When we talk about the rapture of the church, Jesus says, I will come again and receive you unto myself. Paul says, he's coming from heaven. He's going to stop in the air. He's going to say, come on up here. And Christians that have died in the past, they're in their graves. They're going to come out of their graves. So the graves open up. And whether they've been lost at sea or they've been atomized some other way, the fact is God's going to bring them back together and give them new bodies, and they're going to start rising first. The dead in Christ shall rise first, and then we which remain, all the Christians on planet Earth, all the way around, those that remain, we're going to join those that have died before, those in the Christian age, and we're going to meet Jesus in the air. He's going to take us to heaven. Then we have the second coming. How would you say the rapture and the second coming are two different events, and yet they're one at the same time. Well, there, there's two phases to the second coming of Jesus. At Jesus' first coming, it happened in different phases. There was his birth, his life, his death, and then three days later was a resurrection, and then after that was his ascension to heaven. So there were phases to Christ's first coming. So the second coming of Christ happens in two phases. There's what we call the rapture phase, when the Lord comes and we, we meet Him in the air. He doesn't come all the way back to the earth. But at the return, according to Zechariah 14, He's coming all the way back to the earth. Um, at the rapture phase, He's going to come for His saints. He's going to come and catch us away to heaven to be with Him to the Father's house. But at the return, 
He's going to come with His saints. We're going to come back down uh, to this earth with Him. So there are some differences here, some kind of irreconcilable differences, if you will, here between the rapture and the return that, that cause us to believe that these are two distinct phases or stages of that kind of one event that we call the second coming. So we don't believe in two second comings. We believe there will be two phases to that second coming, a rapture uh, where he'll come in the air for his saints and a return when he comes to the earth with his saints. Yeah. Not to overstate the obvious, but you can't come with the saints until you have come for the saints. That's right, right. yes. Yeah, let's talk about 1 Thessalonians 1, 9 and 10 because this talks about a word that's a theological word called imminency. And we're going to define that word, but listen to uh, just straight English here. Paul says to these Christians at Thessalonica in Thessalonians 1, 9 and 10, folks, you turn to God from idols to serve the living and true God and to wait for his son from heaven, whom he raised from the dead, even Jesus, which delivers us from the wrath to come. A lot of us that are Christians, we're in the same boat as these Thessalonica people. The fact is we're waiting for Jesus to come back. What is the significance, Mark, of these words? Well, the word wait there it's, is in the present tense in Greek, which means we're to always be waiting. It's something we're always waiting for. In other words, it can happen at any moment of time. And also the word, you could translate it even there to wait up. We're, yeah. we're waiting up for him. The idea that can happen at any moment, like you're waiting for a loved one to, to get back from a, a long trip and they're coming late at night and you're, you're waiting up for them to come. So it expresses this idea that the coming of Jesus can happen at any moment of time. Right. And that's what we call imminency. Right. There's, there's a distinction, of course, between the second coming and the rapture here because the rapture is a signless event. Nothing has to take place before it occurs whereas the second coming is preceded by seven years of signs. Yeah. And also this Good doctrine point. of imminency, John, is taught throughout the New Testament. And there are some two <clears throat> dozen passages that talk about the early churches eagerly anticipating the return of Christ. We look for uh, our Savior to come from heaven. It's the blessed hope. And so really throughout the whole New Testament, you have the spirit of expectancy. Uh, sometimes people will say, well, where do you find this, this idea in the Bible? It's all throughout the New Testament. And so as we see the early church, we see sh she is a bride who is really waiting for that wedding day and anxiously anticipating. Yeah, A.T. Robertson, the Greek scholar said that uh, this waiting, waiting up for, it's mm -hmm. like waiting for a person that's coming and so you're staying up until they get there. This gives it the idea of continuous action, of waiting for someone to keep on waiting for. We as Christians, we need to realize Jesus could come right now. When we're sleeping at night, he could come then. Anytime during our day, we can expect that Jesus could surprise us and he could come right then. And it has an impact on how we live. It's not only hope, but the fact is if you expect Jesus to come back at any moment, you don't want to be doing sin when he shows. Yeah. And okay? it's another distinction between the second coming and the rapture. The second coming, according to Christ and the book of Revelation, is preceded by many signs that lead up to that time. But the rapture is a signless event. There are no signs leading up to the rapture. That's exactly right. And the word, the word we use the word imminent. We, we need to be clear. The word imminent doesn't necessarily mean immediate. Right. Um, it, it means it, it can happen at any moment. It could be immediate. It could be soon, or it could be some years from now. So it simply means that there's nothing that has to happen before the rapture can take place. So it's an event that, that can happen at any moment of time. He also has this word, and we're waiting for God's Son, who's going to come from heaven, and He's going to deliver us from the wrath to come. The Thessalonica people, the Christians, were saying, you know, uh, what about this wrath to come? Is he going to take us away before that wrath comes? Or are we going through it? Or is it going to be somewhere in there? Are we going to experience part of it? What does it mean, Mark? Well, it says he delivers us from or out of the, this coming wrath. And so the, the whole seven-year tribulation period is a time of God's wrath. 
So the only way for him to keep us out of that time of wrath is to deliver us before it comes. And there are many bi- uh, verses in the Bible that talk about how we're not going to experience God's wrath as believers. You know, Romans 8, 1, there's therefore no condemnation to those who are in Christ Jesus. When Jesus died on the cross for us, God put all of our sin on Jesus. And he poured out all of his wrath upon Jesus that was due to us. And because of that, God was satisfied. His wrath against sin was completely satisfied. And those of us who are in Jesus, now we will not experience God's wrath in the future in hell, but we also won't experience the wrath of the coming tribulation period. Now, there are some who try to argue that the church will go through the tribulation. And they say that the church will be kept through the tribulation. But when you look at the biblical facts, it doesn't support it. We know, for example, from Daniel that the Antichrist will persecute and prevail over the saints. We read about the martyrs who will die in mass uh, in the book of Revelation. That's hardly being kept. Rather, Scripture indicates they will be taken out of the actual time period. And Revelation 3.10 backs that up where the church is promised to be kept from the hour of testing that is about to come upon the whole world. And so the whole idea of tribulation where God unleashes His wrath on planet Earth, John, uh, the church is going to be exempt from that. She'll be rescued from that hour of testing. Yeah. The Greek scholars say the King James Version uh, translated that as a a present tense. Uh, It's a past tense. Even Jesus which delivered us from the wrath to come. Uh, but it's a participle in the present tense. And unless the context indicates otherwise, it's referring to continuous action and should be translated to indicate it. It should be something like this. Christ is already given to us as a continuous thing, deliverance from the future time of wrath. It's a guarantee to Christians, you're not going to go in that thing. Mm -hmm. All right? I love that. And uh, George Milligan says, the verb deliver, rumai, refers to a deliverance by a mighty act of power. And then he starts talking about the rapture will be that mighty act of power. When you think about Jesus, God's Son, who comes out of heaven, and he comes for us to rapture us, and he's going to take all of those that have been in the tombs, that have died, that have been Christians in the past, And then he's going to take everybody that's living on earth that's a Christian. And all of a sudden he's going to take all of us, snatch us all to heaven. And as we've already seen, it's going to be less than a second, the blink of an eye. We're going to be gone. Paul says that's a mighty act of power to pull that baby off. We would certainly expect that to be true, though, wouldn't we? After all, Christ is the creator. He created the universe, Colossians 1.16, John 1.3, uh, all throughout Hebrews 1. The creator of the universe can alter the constituent elements of earth in any ways that he wants, including resurrecting people from the dead and translating them instantly uh, into their glorified bodies. Yeah. Art and Gingrich, the Greek scholars, talk about the word ek. He will deliver us from that you were talking about a few moments ago. And he says it indicates Christ will deliver Christians from future wrath by separating them from it, not by sheltering them or by protecting them through the wrath and during the midst of it. But uh, it emphasized the completeness of the deliverance before it even comes to the earth. Now that's an important distinction, John, because uh, I lived on the Gulf Coast for five years. We experienced five different hurricanes. Uh, there were people who, who kind of hunkered down and lived through the hurricanes, but others were given the call to evacuate before the hurricane comes. And so many did, and they were kept from uh, the awful effects of the hurricane. The same is true with the wrath of God. Yeah. We could talk about other Greek scholars, but we're running out of time right now. And what I think is more important is there are people all over the world. Uh, I had a fellow that was uh, in the Ukraine. He had three apartment buildings. He had friends in all three of them, and he was living in one, and he wasn't a Christian. And the Russians were flying over, and they were bombing this city. And one night, they bombed the apartment building to his right, and his friends all died. He wasn't a Christian. He didn't know God, and he was scared to die. He had no peace, and he he couldn't sleep. And uh, 
our program came on in the Ukraine. We're on all the cable that's left. And we were talking about how you can have peace with God through Jesus Christ, how you invite him into your life. He forgives your sins and he promises to take you to heaven. And he invited, he prayed the prayer that we're going to pray in just a little bit. And he invited Christ to come into his life. And he wrote me a note and he said, I now, for the first time, have peace in my heart and I can go to sleep at night even though the Russians are bombing our buildings. And the next night they bombed the building on the left and that went down. His was the only one standing up. He still went to sleep that night with peace in his heart because he says, I know that if my building is bombed, I'll be immediately with the Lord Jesus. And I thought that was the neatest thing, the neatest note that I've received mm -hmm. from people in a long time. But that's exactly what these verses are talking about that when we die, we're going to be immediately with the Lord. But there's some people, guys, that are watching us right now. They don't know there is a due date on their life somewhere along the line. It could be an accident. It could be disease. It could be age. We're all going to die. The fact is, what's going to happen next? Life is short. Eternity is long. Jesus says, you believe in me, I will give you eternal life. Mark? Can you tell the folks how they can know Christ personally? And would you say a prayer that they could follow with you in praying, that they could invite Christ into their life if they so desire right now? Well, sure. It's just as simple as receiving a gift. Um, Jesus has provided salvation as a gift. He died as our substitute on the cross. Uh, the Bible says that the Lord laid on him the iniquity of us all. God took all your sin. Uh, you can never out -sin God's grace. He took all of it, no matter what you've done, and he put it all on Jesus. And, and God poured out his wrath on, on Jesus, the, 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 the sin that he was bearing for us. So by, by simply, and, and Jesus rose again the third day from the dead to conquer death. And by simply receiving that as a gift, you, you can do that. So the Bible says, whoever calls on the name of the Lord will be saved. And so you can pray a, a prayer like this. Just bow your head with me now and pray a prayer like this. And they use this to call on the name of the Lord. Just go to the Lord and say, Lord, I'm, I'm, I'm a sinful person. I've broken your law. Um, I know that. I'm sorry. And the Lord, I, I believe that uh, you poured all my sin on Jesus, that he, he died in my place as my substitute. And I believe he, he rose again from the dead. I receive now that free gift of life and forgiveness that you offer to me uh, through Jesus Christ. Father, I come now and I take that gift. Father, thank you for Jesus and all that he's done for me. And if you prayed that prayer, then we believe that uh, Jesus has come into your heart and life. And he's taken away your sins and he's given you eternal life. And all these things we're talking about here now, they all apply to you as well. And, and you have now a hope, a, a confident, a living hope in Jesus Christ. Yeah, the Bible says, For God sent not a son into the world to condemn the world, but that the world through him might be saved. And so if you prayed that prayer, he saved you. Now, thanks for joining us this week. Next week we're going to talk about some folks that uh, disagree with these views. And we're going to kindly share the biblical information you ought to consider when you're thinking about these things. Okay, thanks for being with me this week and stay tuned because I got a personal word for you in just a moment.